Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 1 The towers of Zenith aspired above the morning mist, austere towers of steel and cement and limestone, sturdy as cliffs and delicate as silver rods. They were neither citadels nor churches, but frankly and beautifully office buildings. The mist took pity on the fretted structures of earlier generations, the post office with its shingle tortured mansard, the red brick minarets of hulking old houses, factories with stingy and sooted windows, wooden tenements colored like mud. The city was full of such grotesqueries, but the clean towers were thrusting them from the business center, and on the further hills were shining new houses, homes they seemed for laughter and tranquility. Over a concrete bridge fled a limousine of long, sleek hood and noiseless engine. These people in evening clothes were returning from an all-night rehearsal of a little theatre play, an artistic adventure considerably illuminated by champagne. Below the bridge curved a railroad, a maze of green and crimson lights. The New York flyer boomed past, and twenty lines of polished steel leaped into the glare. In one of the skyscrapers the wires of the Associated Press were closing down. The telegraph operators wearily raised their celluloid eyeshades after a night of talking with Paris and Peking. Through the building crawled the scrub women, yawning their old shoes slapping. The dawn mist spun away. Cues of men with lunch boxes clumped toward the immensity of new factories, sheets of glass and hollow tile, glittering shops where five thousand men worked beneath one roof, pouring up the honest wares that would be sold up the Euphrates and across the veldt. The whistles rolled out in greeting, a chorus cheerful as the April dawn, the song of labor in a city built, it seemed, for giants. There was nothing of the giant in the aspect of the man who was beginning to awaken on the sleeping porch of a Dutch colonial house in that residential district of Zenith known as Floral Heights. His name was George F. Babbitt. He was forty-six years old now, in April 1920, and he made nothing in particular, neither butter, nor shoes, nor poetry, but he was nimble in the calling of selling houses for more than people could afford to pay. His large head was pink, his brown hair thin and dry, his face was babyish in slumber, despite his wrinkles and the red spectacle dents on the slopes of his nose. He was not fat, but he was exceedingly well fed. His cheeks were pads, and the unroughened hand, which lay helpless upon the khaki-colored blanket, was slightly puffy. He seemed prosperous, extremely married, and unromantic, and altogether unromantic appeared this sleeping porch, which looked on one sizable elm, two respectable grass plots, a cement driveway, and a corrugated iron garage. Yet Babbitt was again dreaming of the fairy child, a dream more romantic than scarlet pagodas by a silver sea. For years the fairy child had come to him. Where others saw but Georgie Babbitt, she discerned gallant youth. She waited for him, in the darkness beyond mysterious groves. When at last he could slip away from the crowded house, he darted to her. His wife, his clamoring friends, sought to follow, but he escaped. The girl fleet beside him, and they crouched together on a shadowy hillside. She was so slim, so white, so eager. She cried that he was gay and valiant, that she would wait for him, that they would sail. Rumble and bang of the milk truck. Babbitt moaned. "'turned over, struggled back toward his dream. "'He could see only her face now beyond misty waters. "'The furnace man slammed the basement door. "'A dog barked in the next yard. "'As Babbitt sank blissfully into a dim, warm tide, "'the paper carrier went by whistling, "'and the rolled-up advocate thumped the front door. "'Babbitt roused, his stomach constricted with alarm. "'As he relaxed, he was pierced by the familiar "'and irritating rattle of someone cranking a Ford. snap up snap up snap -a -pa. Himself a pious motorist, Babbitt cranked with the unseen driver, with him waited through taut hours for the roar of the starting engine, with him agonized as the roar ceased, and again began the infernal patient snap -a, -pa. a round flat sound, a shivering cold morning sound, a sound infuriating and inescapable. Not till the rising voice of the motor told him that the Ford was moving was he released from the panting tension— he glanced once at his favorite tree, elm twigs against the gold patina of sky, and fumbled for sleep as for a drug. He, who had been a boy very credulous of life, was no longer greatly interested in the possible and improbable adventures of each new day. He escaped from reality till the alarm clock rang at 7.20. It 
was the best of nationally advertised and quantitatively produced alarm clocks with all modern attachments, including cathedral chime, intermittent alarm, and a phosphorescent dial. Babbitt was proud of being awakened by such a rich device. Socially, it was almost as creditable as buying expensive cord tires. He sulkily admitted now that there was no more escape, but he lay and detested the grind of the real estate business and disliked his family and disliked himself for disliking them. The evening before, he had played poker at Virgil Gunch's till midnight, and after such holidays he was irritable before breakfast. It may have been the tremendous home-brewed beer of the Prohibition era and the cigars to which that beer enticed him. It may have been resentment of return from this fine, bold man-world to a restricted region of wives and stenographers and of suggestions not to smoke so much. From the bedroom beside the sleeping porch, his wife's detestably cheerful time to get up, Georgie boy, and the itchy sound, the brisk and scratchy sound of combing hairs out of a stiff brush. He grunted. He dragged his thick legs in faded baby blue pajamas from under the khaki blanket. He sat on the edge of the cot, running his fingers through his wild hair, while his plump feet mechanically felt for his slippers. He looked regretfully at the blanket, forever a suggestion to him of freedom and heroism. He had bought it for a camping trip which had never come off. It symbolized gorgeous loafing, gorgeous cursing, virile uh, flannel sheets. He creaked to his feet, groaning at the waves of pain which passed through behind his eyeballs. Though he waited for their scorching recurrence, he looked blurrily out at the yard. It delighted him, as always. It was the neat yard of a successful businessman of Zenith. That is, it was perfection, and made him also perfect. He regarded the corrugated iron garage. For the 365th time in a year, he reflected, No class to that tin shack. Have to build me a frame garage. But by golly, it's the only thing on the place that isn't up to date. While he stared, he thought of a community garage for his acreage development, Glen Oriole. He stopped puffing and jiggling. His arms were akimbo. His petulant, sleep-swollen face was set in harder lines. He suddenly seemed capable, an official, a man to contrive, to direct, to get things done. On the vigor of his idea, he was carried down the hard, clean, unused-looking hall into the bathroom. Though the house was not large, it had, like all houses on Floral Heights, an altogether royal bathroom of porcelain and glazed tile and metal sleek of silver, the towel rack was a rod of clear glass set in nickel. The tub was long enough for a Prussian guard, and above the set bowl was a sensational exhibit of toothbrush holder, shaving brush holder, soap dish, sponge dish, and medicine cabinet, so glittering and so ingenious that they resembled an electrical instrument board. But the Babbitt, whose god was modern appliances, was not pleased. The air of the bathroom was thick with the smell of a heathen toothpaste. Verona, been at it again. Instead of sticking to Lilidor like I've repeatedly asked her, she's gone and gotten some confounded stinkum stuff that makes you sick. The bath mat was wrinkled, and the floor was wet. His daughter, Verona, eccentrically took baths in the morning now and then. He slipped on the mat and slid against the tub. He said, Damn! Furiously he snatched up his tube of shaving cream— Furiously he lathered with a belligerent slapping of the unctuous brush. Furiously he raked his plump cheeks with a safety razor. It pulled. The blade was dull. He said, "'Damn! Oh! Oh! Damn it!' He hunted through the medicine cabinet for a packet of new razor blades, reflecting, as invariably, "'Be cheaper to buy one of these dinguses and strop your own blades.' And when he discovered the packet— Behind the round box of bicarbonate of soda, he thought ill of his wife for putting it there, and very well of himself for not saying, Damn! But he did say it, immediately afterwards, when, with wet and soapy, slippery fingers, he tried to remove the horrible little envelope and crisp, clinging, oiled paper from the new blade. Then there was the problem, off-pondered, never solved, of what to do with the old blade, which might imperil the fingers of his young... As usual, he tossed it on top of the medicine cabinet with a mental note that some day he must remove the fifty or sixty other blades that were also temporarily piled up there. He finished his shaving in a growing testiness increased by his spinning headache and by the emptiness in his stomach. When he was done, his round face smooth and streamy and his eyes stinging from soapy water, he reached for a towel. The family towels were wet, wet and clammy and vile, all of them wet, he found, as he blindly snatched them, his own face towel, his wife's, 
Verona's, Ted's, Tinker's, and the lone bath tower with the huge welt of initial. Then George F. Babbitt did a dismaying thing. He wiped his face on the guest towel. It was a pansy-embroidered trifle which always hung there to indicate that the Babbitts were in the best floral height society. No one had ever used it. No guest had ever dared to. Guest secretively took a corner of the nearest regular towel. He was raging. By golly, here they go and use up all the towels, every dog on one of them, and they use them and get them all wet and sopping and never put out a dry one for me. Of course, I'm the goat, and then I want one, and I'm the only person in the doggone house that's got the slightest doggone bit of consideration for other people and thoughtfulness, and consider there may be others that may want to use the doggone bathroom after me, and consider... He was pitching the chill abominations into the bathtub, pleased by the vindictiveness of that desolate flapping sound, and in the midst his wife serenely trotted in, observed serenely, "'Why, Georgie, dear, what are you doing?' "'Are you going to wash out the towels? "'Why, you needn't wash out the towels. "'Oh, Georgie, you didn't go and use the guest towel, did you?' "'It is not recorded that he was able to answer. "'For the first time in weeks, "'he was sufficiently roused by his wife to look at her. "'Myra Babbitt, Mrs. George F. Babbitt, "'was definitely mature. "'She had creases from the corners of her mouth "'to the bottom of her chin, "'and her plump neck bagged. But the thing that marked her as having passed the line was that she no longer had reticences before her husband, and no longer worried about not having reticences. She was in a petticoat now, and corsets which bulged, and unaware of being seen in bulgy corsets. She had become so dolly habituated to the married life that, in her full matronliness, she was as sexless as an anemic nun. She was a good woman, a kind woman, a diligent woman— but no one, save perhaps Tinker, her ten-year-old, was at all interested in her, or entirely aware that she was alive. After a rather thorough discussion of all the domestic and social aspects of towels, she apologized to Babbitt for his having an alcoholic headache, and he recovered enough to endure the search for a BVD undershirt which had, he pointed out, malevolently been concealed among his clean pajamas. He was fairly amiable in the conference on the brown suit. "'What do you think, Myra?' he pawed at the clothes hunched on a chair in their bedroom while she moved about mysteriously adjusting and patting her petticoat and, to his jaundiced eye, never seemed to get on with her dressing. "'How about it? Shall I wear the brown suit another day?' "'Well, it looks awfully nice on you. I know, but gosh, it needs pressing.' Well, "'That's so. Perhaps it does. It certainly could stand being pressed, all right.' "'Yes. Perhaps it wouldn't hurt it to be pressed.' "'But, gee, the coat doesn't need pressing. "'No sense in having the whole darn suit pressed "'when the coat doesn't need it.' Well, "'That's so. "'But the pants certainly need it, all right. "'Look at them. "'Look at those wrinkles. "'The pants certainly do need pressing.' "'That's so. "'Oh, Georgie, why couldn't you wear the brown coat "'with the blue trousers? "'We were wondering what we'd do with them.' "'Good Lord! "'Did you ever in all my life know me to wear the coat of one suit "'and the pants of another? "'What do you think I am, a busted bookkeeper?' "'Well, why don't you put on the dark grey suit today "'and stop in at the tailor's and leave the brown trousers?' "'Well, they certainly need... Well, "'Now where the devil is that grey suit? "'Oh, oh, yes, here we are.' Mm. "'He was able to get through the other cries of dressing "'with comparative resoluteness and calm. "'His first adornment was the sleeveless, dimity, BVD undershirt "'in which he resembled a small boy, "'humorlessly wearing a cheesecloth tabard at a civic pageant.' He never put on BVDs without thanking the God of Progress that he didn't wear tight, long, old-fashioned undergarments like his father-in-law and partner, Henry Thompson. His second embellishment was combing and slicking back his hair. It gave him a tremendous forehead, arching up two inches beyond the former hairline, but most wonder-working of all was the donning of his spectacles. There is character in spectacles— the pretentious tortoise shell, the meek pinchnez of the school teacher, the twisted silver framed glasses of the old villager. Babbitt's spectacles had huge, circular, frameless lenses of the very best glass. The ear pieces were thin bars of gold. In them he was the modern businessman, one who gave orders to clerks, and drove a car, and played occasional golf, and was scholarly in regard to salesmanship. His head suddenly appeared not babyish, but weighty and you noted his heavy, blunt nose, his straight mouth and thick, long upper lip, his chin over-fleshy but strong, 
with respect, you beheld him put on the rest of his uniform as a solid citizen. The grey suit was well cut, well made, and completely undistinguished. It was a standard suit. White piping on the V of the vest added a flavor of law and learning. His shoes were black-laced boots, good boots, honest boots, standard boots, extraordinarily uninteresting boots. The only frivolity was in his purple knitted scarf, with considerable comment on the matter to Mrs. Babbitt, who, acrobatically fastening the back of her blouse to her skirt with a safety pin, did not hear a word he said. He chose between the purple scarf and a tapestry effect, with stringless brown hops among blown palms, and into it he thrust a snakehead pin with opal eyes. A sensational event was changing from the brown suit to the grey the contents of his pockets. He was earnest about these objects. They were of eternal importance, like baseball or the Republican Party. They included a fountain pen and a silver pencil, always lacking a supply of new leads, which belonged in the right-hand upper vest pocket. Without them, he would have felt naked. On his watch chain were a gold penknife, silver cigar cutter, seven keys, uh, the use of two of which he had forgotten, and incidentally a good watch. Depending from the chain was a large yellowish elk's tooth proclamation of his membership in the brotherly and protective order of elks. Most significant of all was his loose leaf pocket notebook, that modern and efficient notebook which contained the addresses of people whom he had forgotten prudent memoranda of postal money orders which had reached their destinations months ago, stamps which had lost their mucilage, clippings of verses by T. Chamond de la Frink, and of the newspaper editorials from which Babbitt got his opinions and his polysyllables, notes to be sure, and do things which he did not intend to do, and one curious inscription, D-S-S-D-M-Y-P-D-F. But he had no cigarette case. No one had ever happened to give him one, so he hadn't the habit, and people who carried cigarette cases he regarded as effeminate. Last, he stuck in his lapel the Boosters Club button. With the conciseness of great art, the button displayed two words, Boosters Pep. It made Babbitt feel loyal and important. It associated him with good fellows, with men who were nice and human and important in business circles. It was his V.C., his Legion of Honor ribbon, his Phi, Beta, Kappa, Key. With the subtleties of dressing ran other complex worries. "'I feel kind of punk this morning,' he said. "'I think I had too much dinner last evening. You oughtn't to serve those heavy banana fritters.' "'But you asked me to have some.' Oh, I, "'I know. But I tell you, when a fellow gets past forty, he has to look after his digestion.' There's a lot of fellows that don't take proper care of themselves. I, I tell you, at forty, a man's a fool, or his doctor, I mean, his own doctor. Folks don't give enough attention to this matter of dieting now. I think, uh, of course, a man ought to have a good meal after the day's work, but it would be a good thing for both of us if we took lighter lunches. But, Georgie, here at home, I always do have a light lunch. Mean to imply I make a hog of myself eating downtown? Yes, sure. You'd have a swell time if you had to eat the truck that new steward hands out to us at the athletic club. But I certainly do feel out of sorts this morning. Funny. Uh, got a pain down here on the left side, but... Well, no, that wouldn't be appendicitis, would it? Last night, when I was driving over to Burge Gunch's, I felt a pain in my stomach, too. Right here it was. Uh, kind of a sharp shooting pain. I... Where'd that dime go to? Oh, why don't you serve more prunes at breakfast? Uh, of course, I eat an apple every evening. An apple a day keeps the doctor away, but still, you ought to have more prunes, and not all these fancy doodads. The last time I had prunes, you didn't eat them. Well, I didn't feel like eating them, I suppose. Matter of fact, I think I did eat some of them. Anyway, I tell you, it's mighty important, too. I, I was saying to Verge Gunch just last evening, most people don't take sufficient care of their digest... "'Shall we have the Gunches for our dinner next week?' "'Why, sure, you bet. "'Now, see here, George, I want you to put on your nice dinner jacket that evening. Oh, "'Rats! The rest of them won't want to dress.' "'Of course they will. "'You remember when you didn't dress for the Littlefield supper party, "'and all the rest did, and how embarrassed you were?' "'Oh, embarrassed, hell! Uh, I wasn't embarrassed. "'Everybody knows I can put on as expensive a tux as anybody else, "'and I should worry if I don't happen to have it on sometimes, well... Huh? All a darn nuisance, anyway. All right for a woman that stays around the house all the time. But when a feller's worked like the Dickens all day, he doesn't want to go and hustle his head off getting into the soup and fish for a lot of folks that he's seen in just regular, ordinary clothes that same day. 
You know you enjoy being seen in one. The other evening you admitted you were glad I insisted on your dressing. You said you felt a lot better for it, and— Oh, Georgie, I do wish you wouldn't say tux. It's dinner jacket. Oh, rats, what's the odds? Well, it's what all the nice folks say. Suppose Lucille McKelvey heard you calling it a tux. Well, that's all right now. Lucille McKelvey can pull anything on me. Her folks are as common as mud, even if her husband and her dad are millionaires. I suppose you're trying to rub in your exalted social position. Well, let me tell you that your revered paternal ancestor, Henry T., doesn't even call it a tux. He calls it a bobtail jacket for a ringtail monkey, and you wouldn't get him into one unless you chloroformed him. Now, don't be horrid, Georgie. Well, I don't want to be horrid, but, Lord, you're getting as fussy as Verona. Ever since she got out of college, she's been too rambunctious to live with, doesn't know what she wants. Well, I know what she wants. All she wants is to marry a millionaire and live in Europe and hold some preacher's hand and simultaneously at the same time stay right here in Zenith and be some blooming kind of socialist agitator or boss charity worker or some damn thing. Lord. And Ted is just as bad. He wants to go to college and he doesn't want to go to college. Only one of the three that knows her own mind is Tinker. Simply can't understand how I ever came to have a pair of shilly-shallying children like Roan and Ted. I may not be any Rockefeller or James J. Shakespeare, but I certainly do know my own mind, and I do keep right on plugging along in the office, and do you know the latest? Far as I can figure out, Ted's newbie is he'd like to be a movie actor, and, and here, I've told him a hundred times, if he'll go to college and law school and make good, I'll set him up in business, and v Verona, just exactly as bad, doesn't know what she wants. Well, well, come on, aren't you ready yet? The girl rang the bell three minutes ago. Before he followed his wife, Babbitt stood at the westernmost window of their room. This residential settlement, Floral Heights, was on a rise, and though the center of the city was three miles away, Zenith had between three and four hundred thousand inhabitants now, he could see the top of the Second National Tower, an Indiana limestone building of thirty-five stories. Its shining walls rose against April's sky to a simple cornice like a streak of white fire. Integrity was in the tower, and decision— it bore its strength lightly as a tall soldier. As Babbitt stared, the nervousness was soothed from his face. His slack chin lifted in reverence. All he articulated was, "'That's one lovely sight.' But he was inspired by the rhythm of the city. His love of it renewed. He beheld the tower as a temple spire of the religion of business, a faith compassionate, exalted, surpassing common men. And as he clumped down to breakfast, he whistled the ballad, Oh, by gee, by gosh, by jingo, as though it were a hymn, melancholy and noble. The end of chapter one of Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Read by Rick Kistner for Latino. Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter two. Relieved of Babbitt's bumbling and the soft grunts with which his wife expressed the sympathy she was too experienced to feel and much too experienced not to show, their bedroom settled instantly into impersonality. It gave on the sleeping porch. It served both of them as a dressing room, and on the coldest nights Babbitt luxuriously gave up the duty of being manly and retreated to the bed inside to curl his toes in the warmth and laugh at the January gale. The room displayed a modest and pleasant color scheme after one of the best standard designs of the decorator who did the interiors for most of the speculative builder's houses in Zenith. The walls were gray, the woodwork white, the rug a serene blue, and very much like mahogany was the furniture. The bureau, with its great clear mirror, Mrs. Babbitt's dressing table with toilet articles of almost solid silver, the plain twin beds between them a small table holding a standard electric bedside lamp, a glass for water, and a standard bedside book with coloured illustrations, what particular book it was cannot be ascertained since no one had ever opened it. The mattresses were firm but not hard, triumphant modern mattresses which had cost a great deal of money. The hot water radiator was of exactly the proper scientific surface for the cubic contents of the room. The windows were large and easily opened, with the best catches and cords, and Holland roller shades guaranteed not to crack. It was a masterpiece among bedrooms, right out of cheerful modern houses for medium incomes, only it had nothing to do with the Babbitts nor with anyone else. If people had ever lived and loved here, read thrillers at midnight, and lain in beautiful indolence on a Sunday morning, there were no signs of it. It had the air of being a very good room in a very good hotel. 
one expected the chambermaid to come in and make it ready for people who would stay but one night, go without looking back, and never think of it again. Every second house in Floral Heights had a bedroom precisely like this. The Babbitt's house was five years old. It was all as competent and glossy as this bedroom. It had the best of taste, the best of inexpensive rugs, a simple and laudable architecture, and the latest conveniences. Throughout, electricity took the place of candles and slatternly hearth fires. Along the bedroom baseboard were three plugs for electric lamps concealed by little brass doors. In the halls were plugs for the vacuum cleaner, and in the living room plugs for the piano lamp for the electric fan. The trim dining room, with its admirable oak buffet, its leaded glass cupboard, its creamy plaster walls, its modest scene of a salmon expiring upon a pile of oysters, had plugs which supplied the electric percolator and the electric toaster. In fact, there was but one thing wrong with the Babbitt house. It was not a home. Often of a morning, Babbitt came bouncing and jesting into breakfast, but things were mysteriously awry today. As he pontifically treaded the upper hall, he looked into Verona's bedroom and protested, "'What's the use of giving the family a high-class house when they don't appreciate it and tend to business and get down to brass tacks?' He marched upon them. Verona, a dumpy brown-haired girl of twenty-two, just out of Bryn Mawr, given to solicitudes about duty and sex and God and the unconquerable bagginess of the grey sports suit she was now wearing. Ted, Theodore Roosevelt Babbitt, a decorative boy of seventeen. Tinker, uh, Catherine, still a baby at ten, with radiant red hair and a thin skin which hinted of too much candy and too many ice-cream sodas. Babbitt did not show his vague irritation as he tramped in. He really disliked being a family tyrant, and his nagging was as meaningless as it was frequent. He shouted at Tinker, "'Well, Kitty doodly It was the only pet name in his vocabulary, except the dear and hun with which he recognized his wife, and he flung it at Tinker every morning. He gulped a cup of coffee in the hope of pacifying his stomach and his soul. His stomach ceased to feel as though it did not belong to him, but Verona began to be conscientious and annoying, and abruptly there returned to Babbitt the doubts regarding life and families and business which had clawed at him when his dream life and the slim fairy girl had fled. Verona had for six months been filing clerk at the Grunsberg Leather Company offices with a prospect of becoming secretary to Mr. Grunsberg, and thus, as Babbitt defined it, getting some good out of your expensive college education till you're ready to marry and settle down. But now, said Verona, Father, I was talking to a classmate of mine that's working for the Associated Charities. Oh, Dad, there's the sweetest little babies that come to the milk station there, and I feel as though I ought to be doing something worthwhile like that. What do you mean, worthwhile? If you get to be Grunsberg's secretary, and maybe you would, if you kept up your shorthand and didn't go sneaking off to concerts and talk fests every evening, I guess you'll find thirty-five or forty bones a week worthwhile. Oh, I know, but, oh, I want to contribute. I wish I were working in a settlement house. I wonder if I could get one of the department stores to let me put in a welfare department with a nice restroom and chintzes and wicker chairs and, and so on and so forth. Or I could... Now nah, you look here. The first thing you got to understand is that all this uplift and flip-flop and settlement work and recreation is nothing in God's world but the entering wedge for socialism. The sooner a man learns he isn't going to be coddled, and he needn't expect a lot of free grub and uh, all these free classes and flip-flops and doodads for his kids unless he earns them, why, the sooner he'll get on the job and produce, produce, produce. That's what the country needs, and not all this fancy stuff that just enfeebles the willpower of the working man and gives his kids a lot of notions above their class. And you, if you tend to business instead of fooling and fussing all the time, huh? Why, when I was a young man, I made up my mind what I wanted to do and stuck to it through thick and thin, and that's why I'm where I am today. And Myra, what do you let the girl chop the toast up into these dinky little chunks for? Can't you get your fist onto them? Half gold, anyway. Ted Babbitt, junior in the Great East Side High School, had been making hiccup-like sounds of interruption. He blurted now. Say, Roan, you're going to... Verona world. Ted, will you kindly not interrupt us when we're talking about serious matters? Oh, punk, said Ted judiciously. Ever since somebody slipped up and let you out of college, ammonia, you've been pulling these nut conversations about whatnots and so ons and so forth. 
Are you going to... I want to use the car tonight. Babbitt snorted. Oh, you do? May want it myself. Verona protested. Oh, you do, Mr. Smarty. I'm going to take it myself. Tinker wailed. Oh, Papa, you said maybe you'd drive us down to Rosedale. And Mrs. Babbitt. Careful, Tinker, your sleeve is in the butter. They glared, and Verona hurled. Ted, you're a perfect pig about the car. Of course, you're not, not at all. Ted could be maddingly bland. You just want to grab it off right after dinner and leave it in front of some skirts house all evening while you sit and gas about literature and the highbrows you're going to marry, if they only propose. Well, Dad oughtn't to ever let you have it. You and those beastly Jones boys drive like maniacs. The idea of your taking the turn on Chautauqua Place at forty miles an hour. Ah, oh, where do you get that stuff? You're so darn scared of the car that you drive uphill with the emergency brake on. I do not. And you, always talking about how much you know about motors, and Eunice Littlefield told me you said the battery fed the generator. You... Why, my good woman, you don't know a generator from a differential. Not unreasonably was Ted lofty with her. He was a natural mechanic, a maker and tinkerer of machines. He lisped in blueprints, for the blueprints came. That'll do now, Babbitt flung in mechanically, as he lighted the glorious, satisfying first cigar of the day, and tasted the exhilarating drug of the Advocate Times headlines. Ted negotiated. Gee, honest, Roan, I don't want to take the old boat, but I promised a couple of girls in my class I'd drive them down to the rehearsal of the school chorus, and gee, I don't want to, but a gentleman's got to keep his social engagements. Well, upon my word, you and your social engagements, in high school. Oh, Ain't we select since we went to that hen college? Let me tell you, there isn't a private school in the state that's got as swell a bunch as we got in Gamma Digamma this year. There's two fellas that their dads are millionaires. Say, gee, I ought to have a car of my own like lots of the fellas. Babbitt almost rose. A car of your own? Don't you want a yacht and a house and a lot? That pretty nearly takes the cake. A boy that can't pass his Latin examinations like any other boy ought to, and he expects me to give him a motor car and I suppose a chauffeur, and an aeroplane, maybe, as a reward for the hard work he puts in going to the movies with Eunice Littlefield. Well, when you see me giving you... Somewhat later, after diplomacies, Ted persuaded Verona to admit that she was merely going to the armory that evening to see the dog and cat show. She was then, Ted planned, to park the car in front of the candy store across from the armory, and he would pick it up. There were masterly arrangements regarding leaving the key and having the gasoline tank filled, and passionately devotees of the great god motor, they hymned the patch on the spare inner tube and the lost jack handle. Their truce dissolving, Ted observed that her friends were a scream of a bunch stuck-up gabby four-flushes. His friends, she indicated, were disgusting imitation sports and horrid little shrieking ignorant girls. Further, "'It's disgusting of you to smoke cigarettes and so on and so forth, "'and those clothes you've got on this morning, "'they're too utterly ridiculous, honestly, simply disgusting.' "'Ted balanced over to the low beveled mirror in the buffet, "'regarded his charms, and smirked. "'His suit, the latest thing in old Eli togs, "'was skin-tight with skimpy trousers to the tops of his glaring tan boots, "'a chorus man waistline, pattern of an agitated check, "'and across the back a belt which belted nothing.' His scarf was an enormous black silk wad. His flaxen hair was ice-smooth, pasted back without parting. When he went to school, he would add a cap with a long visor like a shovel blade. Proudest of all was his waistcoat, saved for, begged for, plodded for, a real fancy vest of fawn with polka dots of a decayed red, the points astoundingly long. On the lower edge of it he wore a high school button, a class button, and a fraternity pin. And none of it mattered. He was supple and swift and flushed. His eyes, which he believed to be cynical, were candidly eager. But he was not over-gentle. He waved his hand at poor, dumpy Verona and drawled, "'Yes, I guess we're pretty ridiculous and disgusticulous, and I rather guess our new necktie is some smear.' Babbitt barked. "'It is. And while you're admiring yourself, let me tell you, it might add to your manly beauty if you wiped some of that egg off in your mouth.' Verona giggled, momentary victor in the greatest of great wars, which is the family war. Ted looked at her hopelessly, then shrieked at Tinker. For the love of Pete, quit pouring the whole sugar bowl on your cornflakes. When Verona and Ted were gone and Tinker upstairs, Babbitt groaned to his wife. Nice family, I must say. 
I don't pretend to be any ba lamb, and maybe I'm a little cross-grained at breakfast sometimes, but the way they go on, a jab-jab-jabber, and I simply can't stand it. I swear I feel like going off some place where I can get a little peace. I do think, after a man spent his lifetime trying to give his kids a chance and a decent education, it's pretty discouraging to hear them all the time scrapping like a bunch of hyenas, and never, and never... Curious. Here in the paper, it says... Never silent for one moment. Have you seen the morning paper yet? No, dear. In 23 years of married life, Mrs. Babbitt had seen the paper before her husband just 67 times. Lots of trouble. Terrible big tornado in the south. Hard luck, all right. But this, say, this is corking. Beginning of the end for these fellows. New York Assembly has passed some bills that ought to completely outlaw the socialists. And there's an elevator runner strike in New York, and a lot of college boys are taking their places. That's the stuff. And a mass meeting in Birmingham's demanded that this Mick agitator, this fella De Valera, be deported. Dead right, by golly. All these agitators paid for with German gold anyway, and we got no business interfering with the Irish or any other foreign government. Keep our hands strictly off. And there's another well-authenticated rumor from Russia that Lenin is dead. That's fine. It's beyond me why we don't just step in there and kick those Bolshevik cusses out. Well, that's so, said Mrs. Babbitt. And it says here a fellow was inaugurated mayor in overalls. A preacher, too. Now, what do you think of that? Huh. Well... He searched for an attitude, but neither as a Republican, a Presbyterian, an elk, nor a real estate broker did he have any doctrine about preacher mares laid down for him, so he grunted and went on. She looked sympathetic and did not hear a word. Later she would read the headlines, the society columns, and the department store advertisements. "'Well, what do you know about this? Charlie McKelvey still doing the sassiest stunt as heavy as ever. Here's what that gushy woman reporter says about last night.' Never is society with the big, big S more flattered than when they are bidden to partake of good cheer at the distinguished and hospitable residence of Mr. and Mrs. Charles L. McKelvey, as they were last night, said in its spacious lawns and landscaping, one of the notable sights crowning Royal Ridge, but merry and homelike despite its mighty stone walls and its vast rooms famed for their decoration, their home was thrown open last night for a dance in honor of Mrs. McKelvey's notable guest, Miss J. Sneath of Washington. The wide hall is so generous in its proportions that it made a perfect ballroom, its hardwood floor reflecting the charming pageant above its polished surface. Even the delights of dancing paled before the alluring opportunities for tete-a-tetes that invited the soul to loaf in the long library before the baronial fireplace or in the drawing-room with its deep, comfy armchairs, its shaded lamps just made for a sly whisper of pretty nothings all ado, or even in the billiard-room where one could take a cue and show a prowess at still another game than that sponsored by Cupid and Terpsichore. There was more. A great deal more in the best urban journalistic style of Miss Elnora Pearl Bates, the popular society editor of the Advocate Times. But Babbitt could not abide it. He grunted. He wrinkled the newspaper. He protested. Can you beat it? I'm willing to hand a lot of credit to Charlie McKelvey. When we were in college together, he was just as hard up as any of us, and he'd made a million good bucks out of contracting, and hasn't been any dishonester or bought any more city councils than was necessary. "'And that's a good house of his, though it ain't any mighty stone walls, "'and it ain't worth the ninety thousand it cost him. "'But when it comes to talking as though Charlie McKelvey "'and all that booze hoist and set of his are any bloomin' bunch of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, Vanderbilts, "'why, it makes me tired.' "'Timidly from Mrs. Babbitt. "'I would like to see the inside of their house, though. "'It must be lovely. I've never been inside. "'Well, I have.' "'Lots of, uh, well, a couple of times, to see Chaz about business deals in the evening. "'It's not so much. I wouldn't want to go there to dinner with that gang of high, high binders, "'and and I'll bet I make a whole lot more money than some of those tin horns "'that spend all they got on dress suits and haven't got a decent suit of underwear to their name. "'Hey, what do you think of this?' "'Mrs. Babbitt was strangely unmoved by the tidings from the real estate and building column of the Advocate Times.' Ashtabula Street, 496, J.K. Dawson to Thomas Mullally, April 17th, 15.7 by 112.2, mortgage 4,000, nominal. And this morning Babbitt was too disquieted to entertain her with items from mechanics' liens, mortgages recorded, and contracts awarded. He rose. As he looked at her, his eyebrows seemed shaggier than usual. Suddenly, 
Yeah, maybe. Kind of shame to not keep in touch with folks like the McKelveys. We might try inviting them to dinner some evening. Oh, thunder. Let's not waste a good time thinking about them. Our little bunch has a lot liver times than all those plutes. Just compare a real human like you with those neurotic birds like Lucille McKelvey, all highbrow talk and dressed up like a plush horse. You're a great old girl, hun. He covered his betrayal of softness with a complaining, Say, don't let Tinker go and eat any more of that poison nut fudge, for heaven's sake. Try to keep her from ruining her digestion, I tell you. Most folks don't appreciate how important it is to have a good digestion and regular habits. I'll be back about usual time, I guess. He kissed her. He didn't quite kiss her. He laid unmoving lips against her unflushing cheek. He hurried out to the garage, muttering, "'Lord, what a family! And now Myra's going to get pathetic on me because we don't train with this millionaire outfit. Oh, Lord, sometimes I'd like to quit the whole game, and the whole office worry and detail just as bad, and I act cranky, and, well, I don't mean to, but I get so darn tired!' The End of Chapter 2 of Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu.